Ms. Grace, and I'm one of the 4-H agents here in Duval County. Um, Ms. Kelsey Haupt will be introducing herself in just a little while as we talk some about county events tonight. But first, we do have a guest presenter who is joining us to talk about photography, and that is Miss Katie Rocks, and she is a member of the Rabbiteers Club and has done quite a bit with photography in the past and has a lot of experience in that area. So she's going to be sharing some tips and tricks in photography to get us started and then make sure you're paying attention because we'll be talking when we start sharing about county events on ways that you can take some photos and enter them into our local photo contest. So without further ado, Miss Katie, we will let you share your screen and you are good to get started. And if you have any questions as Katie is presenting, you can definitely type them in the chat box. Um, we'll answer all questions at the end of her presentation. And you'll also have a chance to ask some questions live at the end of her presentation too. So Katie, it's all yours. Uh, today, I'll be sharing some photography tips. No matter what kind of camera you have, with the right knowledge, you can take great pictures. I often use a DSLR camera on a tripod because it is too heavy for me to hold. The tripod keeps the camera steady. I also use aperture priority mode, which means I choose the depth of field I want and the camera does the rest. Professionals use these methods and so can you. You can take great pictures of your phone. I shoot in portrait mode or use an app to get depth of field. You can try special lens attachments like a wide angle or macro lens too. That's what I'm using here in these photos. You may be wondering what depth of field is. It's basically how much of your image is in focus. A narrow depth of field means only a specific part of the image is in focus and the rest is blurry on purpose. Large depth of field means a substantial part of the image is in focus. This graphic does a great job of illustrating depth of field. In both pictures, the rabbit is the subject and in focus. However, when the aperture is a small number, only the rabbit is in focus. With the large aperture, everything is in focus and the rabbit easily gets lost in the scene. I took these photos to photography contest last year. On the rose, only the large water droplet is in focus. This is a macro shot with a small depth of field. The second photo uses the large depth of field, so the entire scene is in focus. The rule of thirds is a technique in photography. It separates an image using horizontal and vertical lines. There are four intersecting points where science has shown the human eye is most drawn to. You don't need to have something on all four points of every photo you take. Sometimes you might only use one or two. This is the grid with the four intersecting points. You can set up your camera or phone to show the squid on the screen as you take your pictures. I had the camera on a tripod and used the grid on the screen to set up my objects for a still life for last year's contest. The macarons are on the bottom horizontal line and the Eiffel Tower is on the right vertical line.
There are some basic rules you should try to follow for your photography. Horizons should be straight, for example. And if they are placed in the middle of your image with no special elements, it will be uninteresting. You want to have the horizon line on the bottom or top third of your image using the rule of third squid. Compose your image based on where the most interesting elements are. Experiment taking different photographs of the same scene to see what you like better. <coughs> there are rules of people pictures too. You don't want to behead your subject with the horizon, for example, or have objects popping out of their heads. Here's the horizon, a fence cutting through my head versus no horizon. A clean background can make a big difference. Tree going out of my head versus no tree. I did not move between the two pictures the photographer did to change the perspective and avoid the tree sticking out of my head. Catch lights give eyes life and capture emotion. Natural or artificial lights can create them. They are very important to have. You can see the difference here. Without catch lights, your subject's eyes will look flat and lifeless. Catch lights are as important for pets as they are for people. These are two more photos I took for last year's contest. Pay attention to light. It can make or break a photo. Know where the light is coming from. Don't make people face the sun. In the first picture, I am looking into the sun and am miserable. My neck and shoulders are tense. My teeth are clenched. I am squinting and my eyes are very small. In the second picture, I am in the shade, with a tree blocking the sun from my eyes. I have a relaxed smile and posture and my eyes are more open. This time, I moved as well as the photographer. The result is a much better image. This is a good way to take advantage of the harsh sunlight, which can be difficult to shoot in. Shadows can hurt or help your photos. You need to be as aware of them as you are light. This photo is taken during golden hour, a favorite time for photographers. It occurs twice per day, in the hour after sunrise, in the hour before sunset. Notice how soft, even, and literally golden the light is. It's beautiful. You want to be aware of the colors present in your photos. Some colors go well together, others clash. If you want to show texture, you need to get in close. And sometimes black and white is the way to go. On the left, I used complementary colors in the color wheel, a tool I use often to plan my photo shoots. On the right, I got an extra close of a macro lens attached to a phone for texture.
On the left, there are too many colors competing for your attention. The eye does not know where to look. On the right, the focus is on the subject. All, of, all the distractions have been removed. This is an example of black and white walking better than color. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Have fun out there taking pictures and best of luck to all of us entering the photography contest. Thanks, Katie. Does anybody have any questions for Katie about photography? Should we give her a round of applause for presenting? Katie, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, you talked a lot about aperture settings. Is that something that we can find on most cell phones as well as DSLR cameras? Or is that going to be harder to find on a cell phone? It's definitely going to be harder to find on a cell phone. Not all cell phones have it. Some have it built in, but you can use an app that has aperture if your phone doesn't have aperture built in. Nice. Is there a specific app that you've used in the past that you like? Um, not really. There are lots of great photography apps. Perfect. Anybody else have any questions before we move on? Okay, well, thanks, Katie. Thanks so much for presenting and sharing all about photography. Hopefully everybody learns something and that they use it when they participate in the photography contest for county events. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so everybody sees my screen. So today we are gonna be talking about our county event competitions. And county events this year is going to be April 3rd. It's a Saturday of 2021. So as we're going through this, feel free at any time to unmute yourself and ask questions or to type in the chat box. If you have any questions, Ms. Grace is gonna keep an eye on that for us and let me know if you have anything. And I'm gonna ask you questions so you can feel free to, again, type in the chat box or unmute yourself if you have any questions. So hopefully you're gonna learn all about county events and maybe have a little bit of an idea of what you wanna do and what you would like to compete in this year in our county events program. So what are the Duval County 4-H event contests? Okay, so county events, that name, you might be like, well, what, what does it mean, county events? Well, just think of it as a series of competitions that you can be a part of. And there's five different things that you can get involved with. You can compete in a public speaking presentation. You can do a demonstration or illustrated talk. You can do share the fun, which is like a talent show. You can compete in the photography contest, or you can compete in the graphic design contest. And we're going to share just a little bit about each one of these tonight for you guys. So a few updates before we get into each contest. This is um, what we usually do, but just as reminders for demonstrations, illustrated talks, 4-H members who are awarded a blue ribbon at county events, they get to advance onto the District 6 contest. For public speaking, the top two scoring 4-H members from each age division, age division, they get to advance to the district contest. So that's a little different for each of those contests. Remember, if you're a demonstration, if you win a blue ribbon, even if every single person who competes wins a blue ribbon, everybody gets to move on. So you just have to win a blue ribbon to move on. If you win a red ribbon for demonstrations and you're willing to come in and do some practice sessions with either Miss Grace or myself, you can then move on to district events as well. For public speaking, top two scoring members of each age division gets to move on. For Share the Fun, again, top two scoring acts from each age division get to advance the district contest. And then for photography, the best in show from each age category will advance directly to the state contest. So photography, there's not a district that goes from our local level 
which is us at Duval County, straight on to the state level. And three photos from each county get to move on, one from each age category. And it can be from any of the categories, um, like the picture category. So it could be a black and white, or it could be people, doesn't matter which um, category like that it's from, it's just the top one photo from each age. Graphic design, any entries that are awarded the blue ribbon, again, advance directly to the state contest. Any questions on that? Let's see if I can. No questions right now, Kelsey. Great, thank you. Okay. So remember too, so your photos and your graphics are due at the time of registration. So registration will open March 1st, which is next Monday, and it'll stay open until March 22nd through your 4-H online profile. When you register, you have to upload your graphic designs and your photos. So they get judged before county events, and then we reveal those scores and the winners at our county events competition. So you have to upload all of your photos and your graphic designs to your registration when you go. So make sure when you go to sign up that you have those ready to go and you have your model releases for your photography ready to go as well. We're going to have a live contest on April 3rd. And there, that is when public speaking happens, demonstrations, illustrated talks, and share the, run, share the fun contest will run. We're going to be this year to help with social distancing, have staggered start times. And as soon as we get our full registration numbers, you will, it will be announced when you would come to the office. So right now the plan is like all pub, those of you who are participating in public speaking will come at a certain time, we'll do public speaking, judge those, and then they'll be released and a new start time for all the demonstrations. And we'll judge those, announce the scores, and then you'll be released and then share the fun will come in. And then we'll do um, a live event for sharing all about photos and graphic design so everybody can hear their scores for that. If we get a lot of people who want to come live, we might even split it up even further. Will there be like session one of public speaking, session two of public speaking? It all depends on how many people are going to sign up, but you'll get all of that information before the day of the event. Okay. This year for district events, so, you know, a lot of times we go to district events we have in person. Well, this year it's going to be all virtual for district events. So if you are um, eligible to move on, you will video your whatever you've, you know, been selected to move on to. So if you're doing public speaking, you'll video your speech, submit it to us by April 20th, and then all of those are going to get submitted to the district level. Those will get scored, and then we're going to have a virtual award ceremony on April 29th at 6 p.m. So those are all virtual. So here at the local level, we're doing in person. And I think I forgot to mention that there will be a virtual option if you don't feel comfortable coming and doing in person. You can zoom in and do your presentation live via Zoom. But for district events, all of that's going to be virtual. Any questions? We had some questions about photography, but we should be answering those when we get to the photo contest section. Okay, perfect. Anything else? Okay, sounds good. If you have questions, feel free to continue to either unmute yourself or to type them in the chat box. So the first thing that we're gonna be talking about is public speaking. So what is public speaking all about? Well, when you do a speech, you, it's not, does not have any visual aids. So that's one of the biggest difference between a public speaking contest and that demonstration illustrated talk contest. So for public speaking, saying a speech, you have no visual aids assisting you. You also do not wear any kind of costume when you give a speech. So you just wear 4-H professional gear. For if you're a junior and intermediate, you'll speak uh, three to seven minutes. And if you're a senior, you'll speak for five to seven minutes. Judges do not ask questions for those who are competing in the public speaking contest. The topic, it can be on anything you want it to be. It could be on your 4-H project if that's what you want it to be about, or it could just be about an interest or a passion that you have. It could be about your dog. It could be about anything that you want it to be on as long as you 
follow the guidelines that are required for public speaking. You speak for three to seven minutes if you're a junior and intermediate, and you speak for five to seven minutes if you're a senior. This is the public speaking score sheet. So whenever you do any kind of competition or even when you're in school and you're taking a test, it's always a good idea to look at the score sheet before you get started to see what you're going to be scored on. So as you can see here, it's broken into two sections. One is all about the speech, is how did you pick a topic that's appropriate for your age? How can you relate it back to 4-H in some way? Because it is important to say that. Do you have a good understanding of the topic? Do you have an opening and main points? Is there transition phrases along the way? Do you summarize? Do you have a conclusion? And do you have good grammar and again, understand that topic? And then the next part is all about you and how you present it. How are you projecting to the audience? Do you have good voice control? Are you making eye contact? Are you standing up straight? Are you well dressed neatly and well groomed? and have some kind of 4-H clover on, which is optional, but it's nice to have. And then they'll score all of that up. And that will be- Ms. Kelsey, um, Hugh is asking for public speaking. Does it need to be scripted? That's a good question, Hugh. So it's definitely a good idea to have an outline of what you're going to be talking about. That way you know that you have a good attention getter, you know you have good main points that are organized, you've included some transition phrases, and you have a conclusion as well. But if you're a speaker who all you want is an outline and you can speak from there, that's fine. Now for me, I like to type out my whole speech and then I like to get the flow of it from there. I'm not going to read my speech, okay? We're not going to have a piece of paper and just read it. And I'm not going to have it fully memorized either. It's going to be a nice balance in between of being very well prepared and also just being able to talk naturally. Does that help answer the question, Hugh? He said that helped. Okay, perfect. Any other questions about public speaking? Okay. So this is what we talked about just a little bit with that score sheet, but this is what a basic outline for public speaking would look like. So you'd have a good introduction, something that really catches that audience's attention. It could be a story or a quote, it could be a question. Somehow that you're going to get that audience to say, hey, I wanna to listen to what this person's about to say. And then you're gonna introduce yourself. And this is where you're going to say, a little bit about yourself as well as your involvement in 4-H. So that's a good place to say, you know, I'm a part of this club, I've been in 4-H for this long. And let's say you're talking about your dog and you say, I'm completing the dog project and today I'm going to share with you all about my dog, something like that. So you're going to tie it back to your 4-H project. Then you're going to have the body. This is the main part of your speech. You can have a couple of different ways you go. One is you could just be very informative to your audience. You're just talking about the different objects, events, or concepts of a speech. You also could persuade the audience. You could be challenging them to think a different way. You could motivate them to take action. However you're going to write your speech, you're going to have clear points, and you're going to transition those points with clear transition statements, saying things like, and then next, and now. Um, my third point is so that the audience can stay along with you as you're giving your speech. Then you're going to wrap it all up, remind the audience what you talked about, and again, leave them in a way that's gonna be memorable. It's nice to sometimes relate it back to that introduction. That's your basic outline for a speech. And now you're gonna get an example of what that looks like. Any questions before we go to the example? Okay, here we go. So we're gonna watch this, it's about three minutes long, but here's an example of what a speech might look like. And note too guys that um, with it only being three minutes, this is a, an older youth participating. 
So he would actually need to expand this and make this speech longer to fit the actual time frame required, but this does give a good job of showing all of those different pieces. The air is hot and humid. Mosquitoes swarm around me. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by screaming children and paint-covered marshmallows are being launched through the air. No, I'm not in the middle of a strange jungle war zone. I'm at 4-H camp. Good morning. My name is Taylor Dykes, and I'm a member of the Town and Country 4-H Club in Alachua County. Today, I'll share how my experience as a 4-H camp counselor taught me how to manage time, how to lead group activities, and how to listen. My information comes from my 4-H agent, my camp counselor trainings, and my personal experience. First, being a camp counselor taught me how to manage time. When I first signed up to be a camp counselor in attendant trainings, I thought that a week of working with a cabin full of eight-year-old campers would be easy. Then we got to camp. Do you know how long it takes an eight-year-old to make their bed? To get ready in the morning? To finish eating lunch? I quickly realized that if we were going to stay on schedule, I would have to manage our time and start planning ahead for the next activity. In addition to learning time management, my experience as a camp counselor also taught me how to lead group activities. Whether it was teaching my campers the rules of Foursquare, demonstrating how to use a kayak paddle, or leading my campers in a resounding rendition of Baby Shark, camp gave me many opportunities to practice and develop my facilitation skills. Camp taught me to manage time and to lead group activities, but the most important lesson I learned at camp was to listen. Keeping your campers safe and making sure that your campers have a good time is important, but sometimes the thing can do the most is someone to listen to them. During my week as a camp counselor, I had so many opportunities to stop and listen to my campers and make sure they felt important. Being a camp counselor means spending a week in a cabin without air conditioning, not getting very much sleep, and being responsible for a whole cabin full of campers. But it also means making friends and watching campers learn to shoot archery, kayak, use a compass, and more. Being a 4-H camp counselor taught me how to manage time, how to lead group activities, and most importantly, how to listen. I can't wait to go back next summer. Okay, guys, what did you think about that? Can anybody name some of the things that he did really well in his speech? You can either unmute yourself or you can type in the chat box. What were some things that he did really well in that speech? Oh. Anybody have any ideas? So all, all the things we talked about, what did he do well? He did a good job of keeping your attention. That's true. He was very confident. He spoke well, right? We could hear him. He projected well. It sounded clear and they understood everything they said. Very good. He had a good conclusion. He wrapped it all up for us, right? He restated his main points and he tied it up at the end. Good job, everybody. Do you guys think that you could do something like that? Is that helpful to know what a speech might look like? Okay, we are going to now talk about the next competition. If I practice enough, yes, you can. And that's it, right? It's all about practicing. Okay. All 
All right, so now we're gonna briefly talk about demonstrations and illustrated talks. So a demonstration or an illustrated talk is a show and tell or how to presentation. So if you want to show us how you tie your shoe or how you braid hair, now we're going into demonstration and illustrated talks and moving away from just the public speaking. Visual aids are used. So a visual aid could be a PowerPoint presentation or could actually have props in front of you. Let's say you're gonna show us how to bake cookies. Well, you could bring the items you need to show how to make cookies with you. Those would be your props for your demonstration. And then we can lump in PowerPoints into this as well. So you could also have no props, but just a PowerPoint and that's that illustrated talk size side of it. That's all in the same category. Here, you can also present as an individual. So there's just one person that's you giving a demonstration or an illustrated talk, or you could have a team of two. So you and one other person could be giving a demonstration. If you're gonna have a team though, you have to be in the same age division to be a team together. And again, there can only be two of you. So you can't have three people, two people for a team. And for juniors and intermediates, it's three to 12 minutes. And for seniors, it's five to 12 minutes. And for this, judges are allowed to ask questions. So um, in public speaking, judges don't ask questions. The audience doesn't ask questions. You just end your speech. But in a demonstration, your judges can ask you questions at the end of it. The audience members are not allowed to ask questions. Any questions on this? <laughs> Okay, so this is what a score sheet would look like. And again, remember, we always wanna review our score sheets before we do any kind of competition to see what we're going to be graded on. And this is broken into a couple of different categories. Your first is just about your appearance. So are you wearing a neat outfit? Are you well-groomed? Do you have good posture? Are you appropriately dressed for what you're doing? And this is where in public speaking, you're not going to really wear a costume. If you wanted to have some, especially if you're in a team, a coordinated outfit, or let's say you're, if you're baking something, you wear an apron, that could be considered a costume. That's allowed in demonstrations. And your voice, you're speaking clearly, um, you're enunciating things correctly, uh, you're enthusiastic about what you're talking about. And it's not, it's scripted, but it's not memorized. And then your organization of your presentation. It has an introduction, it's arranged well, and you use your equipment well. So if I'm giving a presentation on how to bake cookies, I need to be able to talk while I'm demonstrating and using my props all at the same time. So I shouldn't be mixing the dough and not saying anything and the audience is just in silence watching me mix the dough. I need to be talking about what I'm doing while I'm mixing and using my props effectively. You also want to make sure that your audience can see what you're doing. So again, if I'm making those cookies, you don't want your table to be so cluttered that the judges and the audience can't see what you're doing. So everything's arranged nicely and I can use my props effectively um, and talk while I'm using those props. And that's all in that visual aid kind of component of it. It's very logical. So a demonstration should have a one, two, three step to it right? We're not going to talk about baking our cookies before we've even made our dough. So we're talking in a logical sequence. And again, we're able to summarize just like our speech. We wrap up those main ideas. We talk about what we've done and we conclude nicely. There's an extra added five points if you're a team and you're graded on how you work together. Do you bounce back and forth nicely? Um, you can banter back and forth or is it a good flow? Both of you, are you both participating equally? It shouldn't be one person doing all the talking and one person doing all the demonstrations. You both need to have equal parts. And then what about the subject matter? Have you picked an area that you can relate back to your 4-H experience? Is there one theme of your presentation um, and your demonstration? So if we're baking cookies, we're not also talking how to plant a succulent. We're just talking about baking cookies. Um, is your information correct? You know, is it um, challenging enough for your age category? And how well do you know your question, your subject area? 
And can you answer the questions when the judges have them? And then Ms. Grace said, well, what if I don't know the answer to my question? That's okay. You can say to that judge, you know, I'm not sure of the answer right now, but I'll happy to look it up and get back to you. Something like that. You don't ever want to just say, oh, I don't know. You want to say a little bit more than that. For your demonstration or your illustrated talk, your introduction, just like your speech, starts with an attention getter. It could be a story, it could be a quote, it could be a question, something that's going to say to the audience, hey, I want to hear what this person has to say. You introduce yourself, you introduce your 4-H club and your project, and you share with the audience what you're going to be doing, what they are going to be learning as you're going through that demonstration or illustrated talk. Your body is logical. You have transi transition phrases within that presentation. You talk about what you're showing, you're explaining the procedure, and then you have fill time when you're actually doing things. And that fill kind of information that you're giving is related back to what you're doing. Um, so if maybe you have to cut out all of the cookies and you don't have all you're going to say is, well, now we're going to cut out the cookies. Will you start to talk about what your favorite kind of cookie is? Or you can talk about the first time you ever made cookies or something like that to fill that time. But it's related to your topic and it seamlessly, seamlessly goes in with your presentation. And your points are very clear. And then you have a conclusion that reviews and repeats your main points and then refers back to the introduction and cites any sources that you used. And Ms. Kelsey, um, Beatrice asks, can you do two of the same category? So could you compete twice in the same category? Like you wanna do two speeches? Is that what you're kind of thinking, Beatrice? I think she's asking if she can do both a demonstration and an illustration. Okay, so um, demonstration illustrated talk is one category. So you could only do one in each category. So um, you could do one speech, one demonstration, one share the fun, and you could put, compete in all five of them, but you only could do one per category. That help answer? Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to, any other questions? You miss anything else? Okay, great. Let me get to our video. Okay, and now we're gonna watch a sample demonstration. And again, note that this is not the time um, that you need, but it gives you all of the important elements of a demonstration. Everyone, have you ever been looking in your fridge for something to eat and just thought, oh, I would just love a peanut butter and jelly sandwich right now? Well, you're in luck because today I'm going to share with you my special recipe for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My name is Miranda Bird and I am in the Duval Forage program for six years learning to create healthy and fun recipes through my Kids in the Kitchen 4-H Club. My presentation will cover the basic supplies needed to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, the steps of how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and my favorite way to cut and eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Let's get started. First, safety first. Make sure your hands cooking utensils, I'll be using a cutting board, butter knife, and paper plate, have all been sanitized. I have already cleaned my area and washed my hands, I will also be wearing gloves. Next, we will be taking two slices of our choice of bread out. Today, I will be using a white bread. On one slice of the bread, you are going to take the peanut butter and spread it evenly over the slice, just like this. Did you know that Florida grows nearly 13% of all peanuts in the US, only second to Georgia? Now, once I've got it all nice and spread evenly, 
going on to move on to the second slice of bread. And on this slice, I am going to be adding the jelly. So I'm gonna wipe off my knife between ingredients and open up the jelly. My favorite is grape jelly. I don't think anything goes better with peanut butter than grape. I'm just gonna spread it evenly. And while I'm spreading this, let me tell you another fun fact about peanuts. Peanut butter was first introduced at the St. Louis World Fair in 1904, created by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Yep, the famous cereal guy. Right, now that I've got the jelly on nice and spread evenly, I'm going to place the two halves together. One. And now I'm going to cut it down the middle, not diagonally. I mean, who cuts their sandwich diagonally? All right, my peanut butter and jelly sandwich is now complete. The fun part will be taking off my gloves and enjoying a big bite. I have made a few extras if the judges would like to try. Now you know how to curve that afternoon hunger with knowing the steps of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Today I showed the cooking utensils needed to make a sandwich and the steps to create a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And what I think is the best way to eat the sandwich. I received my information from the Kids Cooking 4-H Curriculum and Florida Peanut Producers Association webpage. Thank you. Do the judges have any questions? Okay, what did you guys think of that? What are some good things that she did during her demonstration? The peanut facts. Yeah, that was a really good example. She had some filler time that she was just spreading her peanut butter and her jelly and she didn't want there just to be silence. So she gave some facts about peanut butter. So that's a perfect example of filler facts. Nice job. All right, let's get back to our presentation and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Grace. Okay guys, we're just gonna run through the next contest um, a little bit quickly, but some things to keep in mind as you're working either on demonstrations or some of these apply to speeches as well, is always relating the topic back to your 4-H project or experience. So talk about what is it that made you want to learn about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Well, Miranda said that she used a 4-H um, cooking curriculum, and so that related it back. Maybe you went to 4-H camp one year and you did archery and that made you want to learn more about archery. So now you're going to give an illustrated talk on archery, but something that relates it back to your 4-H experience. Um, and then all of the things that Kelsey talked about are on here. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if something does go wrong during your presentation, something falls off the table or you lose your spot in your speech, don't worry about it. Just take a deep breath and get back on track. The judges aren't gonna fault you if something falls off the table, as long as you keep your presentation going. And if the judge does ask you a question, repeat that question back so the audience can hear it clearly. This is also a nice trick because it gives you a little bit more time to formulate your answer if you're trying to think of what you wanna say. So the question was asked, what brand of peanut butter is the best brand of peanut butter to use with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Um, and then that gives you some time to decide, well, I really like Jif or I really like whatever. Um, we'll go ahead and jump to the next slide here. So one of my favorite contests that we offer in 4-H is the Share the Fun Talent Showcase. And there are different categories, but they all compete against each other. So this just kind of gives you an idea of what types of performances you could do. But if you play an instrument, you could do a musical piece or an instrumental piece. If you're a good singer, 
you could do some singing or you could dance if you like music or do some acrobatic routines. Um, if you are very funny or very dramatic, you could do a drama or novelty um, performance or just a general act, which includes any of the things above or just something else that you come up with. So um, share the fun, the score sheet. I always say it's really important to look at this one because there are only three main categories. So if you don't hit all three of these categories, your performance isn't going to do as well with the judges. So that first category is talent. Think of that as skill. So were you actually able to play the clarinet or have you never picked up a clarinet before and now you're, you're coming to share the fun? Well, if you've never played the clarinet before, you're probably not going to score quite as high on the talent section as, in, um, as if you've been playing all year and working on it. Now, showmanship is super important and you'll notice the next two sections, showmanship and stage appearance, actually are worth more points than that talent section. So you don't have to be the most skilled performer if you have good showmanship and stage appearance. So showmanship is, are you catching the audience's attention? Does the audience like your, your presentation, your performance? Do you look confident? Um, do you feel well rehearsed? And stage appearance is, um, and Kelsey, would you mind closing? Sorry, that box was popping up and I was having a hard time reading the screen. Um, stage appearance is a really important one. A lot of times, and I see this a lot with instrumental performances, is someone is super talented, they have great showmanship, but they aren't necessarily dressed for their performance or they're not wearing a costume or there are no props on the stage. And because stage appearance is 35% or 35 points, um, that's, you're gonna lose quite a bit there if you don't think about what you're wearing or what the stage looks like in addition to your talent. So if we jump to- You do have a question slide. in a visual From art demonstration work, like a handcraft. Hmm, so that would probably, Hugh, be better done as a demonstration than as a, um, share the fun act. So if you were demonstrating how to create your craft, that would be closer to the demonstration side, I think. So all share the fun acts are going to be three to five minutes. And another thing that you start to lose points for is if you're playing a song on the piano or, or whatever instrument it might be, and your act doesn't quite meet that three minute time because the song isn't quite long enough, you might want to think of doing a um, whole series of songs that are related to the same topic so you can get to that three to five minute mark. And acts may be presented by individuals or groups. So if you have some friends from your club that want to compete with you, that is awesome. Or a sibling, um, they do need to be in the same age category as you. Um, and your group act should be limited to five members. Now, if you really, really want to perform with someone, but they aren't in the same age category as you, talk to Miss Kelsey and I. Um, we may be able to move someone up for the for the contest. So we, we can work on that later on if that comes up. So I don't have any um, example videos, but Miss Kelsey, if we could go back to the last slide real quick. Um, this picture does illustrate really well how this individual was singing and playing a song from Tarzan. But in order to up their stage performance, their stage appearance category, they also went ahead and dressed up as a character from Tarzan so they could get the full points in the act. So it wasn't just about the singing and playing, but what did they look like as well? So good things to keep in mind. And then we'll go ahead and jump to our next contest. But are there any other questions about Share the Fun? So if you have a talent, and like we said, that talent section of the rubric, that skill section, actually is, is worth fewer points than the other sections. So you don't have to be 
the greatest pianist on earth in order to compete and share the fun, you just have to be a talented performer. So I would definitely encourage anyone to participate and share the fun. I've seen great skits. I've seen funny stand-up comedies where someone told a series of jokes, um, lots of great musical pieces. There's lots you can do. So the photo contest. So all photos in the photo contest are submitted digitally and I would encourage each of you to participate in this contest this year because we all have access to something we can take a photo with and this is a great way to get started. Um, there is a photo release form and we'll make sure you have access to that when you'll fill that out when you upload your photos at registration. And there's a specific way you need to title your photos, but once again, we'll make sure you have that information when you need it. And you wanna make sure that your photos are at least 800 by 1000 pixels. That means you want your photos to be very sharp. Um, you don't want something that's very pixelated. When you think of those fuzzy type photos, things that got zoomed in too much, um, because you want your photo to be very clear for the judge to be able to evaluate. And each youth can submit no more than one entry per category at the county level. And those categories, there are five of them, so you could submit up to five photos. Those categories are people, flora and fauna, so think plants and animals, scenic, so if you're taking a picture of a landscape or a cityscape, still life would be, think about that example that Katie showed earlier with the macaroons and the Eiffel Tower, so those still objects that aren't moving around, and black and white is a category as well, and black and white could be any of those other things, but shot in black white. And then the state competition. So there's no district level competition for the photo contest. It goes from county directly to state, but the first place junior, intermediate, and senior entry from each county. So three photos total go from Duval County to the state competition. So we award all photos a blue, red, or white ribbon, and then will also recognize the highest scoring photo in each age group. We'll go ahead, yep, perfect, and jump to the next slide. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. You are allowed to make some slight computer um, alterations to your photos like cropping or trimming or adjusting lighting or getting rid of red eyes, um, but you can't do huge changes to your photos for this contest. So you can't change colors um, or apply different design styles or use computer graphics with your photos. The judges wanna see your, your photo skill itself, not your computer skills for this contest. We'll talk about your computer skills for the next contest. Uh, any questions though about photos? You can be typing those as we take a quick look at our score sheet here. And for that score sheet, once again, there are three main categories. So the judges are gonna be looking for impact and creativity. So are you taking a unique approach to your photo? Are you coming at your subject from a fun angle or something that just looks a little different? Does it catch the viewers attention and emotion. And then that execution style, things like sharpness and the um, exposure and lighting of your photo. And then that final category is composition. So like Katie was talking about with the rule of thirds and is your photo uncluttered? Is there a good background? Those are things that would fall into that category. So be considering your impact and creativity, your execution, and your composition when you're deciding which photos you'd like to submit for the contest. Finally is our graphic design contest. 
And we'll keep this section short because we're actually going to send you um, tomorrow a link to a webinar that we taught last year that's all about the graphic design contest and how to design good graphics. But the graphic design contest has four categories. You can create a brochure, which is like a trifold design that's an eight and a half by 11. So we'll think a normal size piece of paper. A flyer, which once again is that eight and a half by 11 size. A PowerPoint presentation, and that needs to have five to 10 slides. And you want to include a script with that presentation. So what would you be saying during each slide? And then that final category is other, and that can pretty much be anything. So do you want to create a bookmark, a postcard, um, some sort of promotional material? The only thing that you couldn't put in other would be an actual video. Um, so it does need to be a, um, something that you could upload as a PDF. And graphics are also due March 22nd when registration is due. Um, once again, there is a specific way that you need to title the file when you upload your PDF file, but we'll make sure you have that information later on. Now, this is an individual contest, so there's no teams and only one entry per youth. So you have to choose either just a PowerPoint or just a flyer, for example. You couldn't do one of each. And you can't do hand-drawn entries for this contest. It does need to be something that you created on a computer. And some important things to keep in mind, you can't use any copyrighted or protected characters or logos in your material. And you always, always, always want to cite your sources. So where did you get the information from? Um, when we look at the score sheet in just a second, and actually we can go ahead and look at the score sheet now, if we want to jump to that next slide. Um, one of the categories is educational components. So your design, whatever you're creating, should be educating your viewers about something. So they need to be learning about something in the flyer or in the brochure, in the PowerPoint, or in whatever the material is that you decide to create. Um, and you're going to tell us, where did you get that information? That's 10 points on your score. And because you need to make a 90 to 100 to receive a blue ribbon, if you lose all 10 of those points for not citing your sources, pretty quickly you're going to get dropped down into that red ribbon category. So you want to make sure you cite your sources. The other things that you want to think about are font styles. So are the fonts you're using complementary? Do you have too many types of fonts or does it all flow well? The flow of your design, um, the colors you use, the educational components, and is your message clearly delivered? Once the viewer looks at your piece, do they know what you are trying to tell them? Now there is a lot there and we recognize that we could talk for a long time about graphic design. And in fact, we have. So like I said, we will be sending you a link to a recording for the graphic design workshop that we taught last year. And it's all applicable to what you're learning um, or what you would be competing in this year. And all blue ribbon entries for graphic design move on to the state level contest. And if you are um, working on a design and you wanna get some feedback, you can always ask Ms. Kelsey and I any questions. We're happy to help answer those for you. But that is the graphic design contest. Mm -hmm.